Hey guys, welcome back or welcome to my channel if you're new here. So today's video is actually going to be about a missing mother who's been missing for about a month now named Maya Malete. However, I will be giving you guys updates on the Jason Landry case, which is the case that I just covered in my last video. And I'll put a link down below if you aren't familiar with the case, but essentially it's a college student who went missing driving along a road. And the police have actually come up with a lot of new information since I made that video. So before I get into my Malete's case, I will be getting into the updates on Jason's case. Also, sorry you guys, I haven't posted in a while. If you guys have been following me on my community tab, you'll know that I got a puppy recently and there's actually a photo of her there. So let me know if you guys would like to see her in the background to some of my videos. I know some other YouTubers do that and people like it. So if enough people are interested, maybe I'll change my background and have her sitting in the background. But enough with the intro, I'll just get into my usual disclaimer. So all the information I'm reporting on is public news that anyone has access to. All the opinions stated are my own unless stated otherwise, and all my sources are listed down below. Now let's get into it. As I said, I'll be starting this video with some updates from Jason's case. So since I last made that video, police have actually come out with a lot of new information and basically put together a better timeline of Jason's night the night he disappeared. So police now know that he left his apartment at approximately 10.55 p.m. on December 13th. His next move, they say, was at 11.05 p.m. and he is seen passing under I-35 in San Marcos on Highway 80. He's said to continue down this highway and the police have timestamps of when he was in each city, but the most important to include is that he entered Lulling, where his car was found, at 11.24 p.m. So shortly after Jason enters Lulling, he continues down Highway 80, which is what he had been traveling on most of his trip, and he continues down to where it becomes Austin Street. And at this point, it's said that Jason stops using his Waze app, so he stops looking at the directions and begins entering in the Snapchat app, and instead is on Snapchat and discontinues looking at his navigation system. Police say he doesn't ever get back on the Waze app for the rest of the trip and goes down Austin Street to the intersection there with Magnolia Avenue and goes straight from this intersection into East Austin. The strangest thing is that at this exact intersection, police say that Jason's digital footprint just stops. Jason never accesses his phone ever again at this point forward, so we have no idea what happened to make him stop using his phone, but what we do know is that he doesn't access his phone from this point on to when he gets into his crash. And police believe that he continues down East Austin Street to Spruce Street, which turns into Salt Flat Road, which is where his crash occurred. The only other exact time that police have is that at 12.31 a.m. on the 14th of January, Jason's car was found. And from that point forward, we don't know what happens. So there's 67 minutes unaccounted for from the time that Jason stops using his phone to the time his car is found. And that's what police are focusing on right now. They say that his phone still had battery in it when it was found. So his phone didn't die and that isn't why he stopped using it. And they're really perplexed as to why he wouldn't use his phone when he got into a car crash. Also, based on the damages that police saw to the car, they believe that no other car was involved in this crash and that it was very clear that Jason hit barbed wire as well as trees and that's what caused the damage to his car. Police have also said that Jason's dad was the first one to go into his car and that there were keys still in the ignition as well as his cell phone was found slid between his driver's seat and the middle console. Jason's father was also apparently the first one to find his clothes scattered 900 feet from the crash site However, I find this to be really strange. The police had gone to the site and tried to find Jason, and I find it weird that they wouldn't have also seen the clothing in the process if they had been looking for him so hard like they say they had. I just find this whole thing to be really strange because, like I said, many people had gone to the crash site before Jason's dad and none of them apparently had seen this clothing. Another weird thing about the clothing is that apparently it only had one smear of blood on it, as well as there was no blood found in the car. And this was the same clothes that Jason was said to be wearing the night that he left his apartment and headed back home. 
and they believe that he had no other clothes on him. So they're implying that he took off his clothes and was out there naked for some period of time. And I find this to be really weird as well because it was 40 degrees that night, around 40 degrees, a little bit colder. And that's pretty cold to be out there, especially naked without any clothes. So I don't know what would possess Jason for him to take off all of his clothes and be out there or why he would have done that. It's a really strange detail and it really makes you wonder what was going on that night. As for the narcotics that were of so much speculation in the last video, Police have released that it was actually Mary Jane, if you know what I mean. I'm not gonna say the actual name of the drug because YouTube is weird and they'll take down this video if I mention it. So, you know, if you guys know what I mean, that's what it was. And it wasn't enough for him to be selling. It was just a small amount that police believe he was just using for personal use. And they say that it actually could have been laced and they're going to test it and get back with the results. But I feel like by now, this has been weeks, they should have tested it and said something if it was laced, or maybe they're keeping that information close to the vest. Either way, we don't know the status if it was laced or not. But if it was, that would definitely make a lot of sense with his weird behavior that night. The last bit of information that police released was that they don't have any persons of interest in the case currently, and that they've talked to his family and his friends and his ex-girlfriend, and they don't believe that any of them were involved. So they really don't have any suspects at this point. And they also don't believe that there's a criminal walking around out in the community. So it really makes me wonder what information they have to believe this. Also, police have said that Jason was not in contact with anyone in Lulling, so he wasn't planning on meeting up with anyone there. And I find this to be really weird because I don't understand why he would be there unless he was planning to meet up with someone. But who knows, maybe he could have gotten lost and just ended up there somehow. So that's some really good information that he wasn't planning on meeting someone there because a lot of people's theories had been based around that. So unfortunately, that's all the new information we have in Jason's case right now. It's really interesting that they released all of this new information at once and I'm hoping more information is to come so we can help find Jason and hopefully give his family some closure and justice in this case. So now I'm gonna transition to the main focus of this video today, which is the case of Maya Malete. Maya, who also goes by the nickname May, is 39 years old and lives in Chula Vista, California with her three kids who are 4, 9, and 11. She attended the University of California at San Diego and is extremely smart, working as a contract specialist for the Naval Base San Diego. Maya is known for being extremely fun-loving and a dedicated mom to her kids. She's also known for the tattoos of musical notes on her shoulder because she's a very talented singer as well as a musician and she plays the guitar. I've actually listened to some of the songs she sang as she does a lot of covers and she's very talented. She has a beautiful voice and she's just really great at the guitar. I'm actually really surprised she didn't end up going into that for a career. She met her husband Larry in high school and they ended up getting married when they were 18. However, it's said that they've been having a lot of marital issues recently and were living in the same house as roommates and weren't really romantically interested in each other anymore. Maya's sister, Maricris, has actually been very active in the media and done a lot of interviews. And in one of them, she confirmed the trouble that Maya was having in her relationship. And she said that her and Larry had not been getting along lately and actually had attended marriage counseling. Maricris's husband also seconded this and said that it seemed like the relationship was over and that it was very clear they weren't getting along, especially over the New Year's holiday this year when the entire family went on a trip together. On this trip, Maricris said that Maya and Larry were fighting over Maya's Jeep, which she really enjoyed driving and was actually part of many Jeep clubs where they would all drive Jeeps together. And she said that Larry kept using the Jeep and Maya wasn't able to use it, even though it was her Jeep. And so they kept getting into fights over this. And it was really clear that Maya just wanted her Jeep back and wanted to be done with the relationship. Now on to the details of Maya's disappearance. So according to law enforcement, Maya was last seen by her family at 5 p.m. on January 7th. However, according to Larry, her husband, she was last seen that night, later that night, by him as well as her children. Later that night on the Thursday, Maya and her husband are said to have gotten into a big fight. However, we have no idea at this point what this fight was about. 
What we do know is that after this fight, Maya stopped responding to texts as well as phone calls and her car was left in the driveway. Her last message that she sent was at 7.52 p.m. that night to a Facebook group that she was a part of. That next day, so on the Friday, Maya couldn't be contacted and she didn't show up to work. Larry says that he could hear her moving around in the house, however, he says that he never physically saw her. Still, he says that he took his four-year-old son out with him that day to where we still don't know, but he left the kids, the rest of the kids, home with Maya, even though he claims that he hadn't seen her. This whole thing is extremely confusing to me. I don't understand why he would leave those young children if he didn't know that Maya was for sure home. You know, he claims that he hadn't seen her that day, so if you haven't seen her and you aren't sure if she's home, then why would you take that risk and leave the kids home? Meanwhile, you're taking, you know, one of your kids out with you. You could have taken the rest of the kids out if you knew for a fact that Maya wasn't home or if you were concerned about these young kids being home alone by themselves. It just seems really weird to me, especially since she wasn't responding to texts that day as well as hadn't shown up to work. However, Maya's family immediately knew something was wrong when she didn't respond to their text messages that Thursday night talking about her daughter's upcoming 11th birthday party, which was going to be that Saturday. So they tried calling her all day Friday, as well as tried calling Larry and their home, but no one picked up and they couldn't get through. So Maya's brother actually stopped by her house to see if everything was okay, and Larry said that Maya was in her room. So he went and knocked on the door and he didn't get a response, so Maya's brother just assumed that she was sleeping and left. At this point, Larry claims he wasn't worried yet because he says that Maya could have been out wine tasting or out with friends, which I find to be kind of weird because, you know, with everything going on in the world right now, a lot of places aren't open and I'm pretty sure in California, the wine tasting places, you know, bars as well aren't open. So I don't know how she could have gone wine tasting. But anyways, he also says that she had been staying out and drinking and not coming home until two or three in the morning. He said that in an interview, which again, I find that to be strange because, you know, she's missing and he's kind of painting her in a negative light. And if you want people to help look for your wife, I feel like you would want to paint her in the most positive way but that's just me. It's on January 9th that Larry says that he actually started to get worried and he kept texting Maya, but he wasn't sure if she was getting the text because she wasn't responding, but he claims to have told her to just let someone know that she was okay and that he was really worried. And he tried to go and check on her, but he says that her door was locked. When no one from Maya's side of the family had heard from her that same Saturday, they began to get even more worried. So Maya's dad went to her house and asked Larry to open up her bedroom door for him. And Larry found the key and opened the door, but Maya wasn't in her room. She wasn't there and it seemed like she had taken her cell phone, her credit card, and her ID because they also weren't in her room. Their worry only increased that next day on Sunday when Maya didn't show up to her daughter's 11th birthday party at Big Bear Lake. They say that she would never miss something like that, so the next day, on January 10th, Maya was reported missing. The day after she was reported missing, so that Monday, Larry says that he called Maya's boss, and her boss said that she hadn't logged into her work account, as well as she hadn't been into work that day. This really concerned him, and he says that also there hadn't been any credit card transactions, as well as any use of her cell phone since that Thursday night. On Wednesday, January 13th, there was a search for Maya at St. San Miguel Park, which is near her house. The theory was that maybe Maya went for a walk to blow off some steam after her argument and got lost out there. Sadly, they came up with nothing. On Thursday, January 14th, Maya's side of the family held a vigil for her. However, it was very noticed that Larry was not in attendance, and he claims this was because he was really overwhelmed by the amount of people there and he wanted to remain private. On January 23rd, the first big break happened in the case when the Malete house was served with a search warrant by 
by police, and they actually left the house with many items. They also searched the yard as well as the garage with canines, and it seemed like they were doing a really thorough search of the area, which makes you wonder what possible tip came in that led them to believe that they could find evidence at the house, and what information they may know behind the scenes that leads them to believe that there could be something important there. This is a big step because you can't just get a warrant because you suspect something might have happened. You have to have probable cause in order to do so. So this means that police do have some evidence that they're holding close to the vest that leads them to believe that likely a crime took place, as well as they're likely to find evidence of this crime in the place that the warrant specifies. So they definitely know more than they're saying because you can't just get a warrant off of mere suspicion. As for the investigation itself, my Maya's family has been very active in the investigation and actually hired a private investigator. So I'm really hoping that helps turn up leads. Her family has also been working really closely with the police and they actually did a press conference last week. So that kind of shows that they're all working together and pooling their resources, hoping to help find Maya. As for Larry, on the other hand, he doesn't have that close relationship with the police. And actually, as of last week, he hired an attorney and is no longer cooperating with the investigation. So police have said that he is not cooperating with them. And so it'll be interesting to see what happens after this point. This is definitely a case where I don't believe she left of her own free will. Her family has been very adamant that she was really close to her children and she wouldn't do this. And from all the research I've done, she seemed like a great mother and that she really loved her job and that she wouldn't have just left. It really makes no sense why she would have just gotten up and left, especially when she just felt so close to her children and was so dedicated to them. I think that something probably happened that made her leave her children and it wasn't by her own choice. As for theories, I think that this is definitely a case where Maya didn't leave of her own free will. She seemed like an extremely dedicated mother, and from everything I've seen, she was also really close to her family. So I don't know why she would have just left her children, and I just don't believe it's possible at this point. And I believe police don't think this is possible either because they're dedicating so many resources to finding her, and if they believe she had ran away, I don't think that they would be this dedicated. Unfortunately, many people believe this is a case of foul play, and a lot of people on the internet are really pointing fingers at Larry because it's come out that he turned off his phone during all of the searches for Maya, as well as also people online, including members of Maya's family, have said that he has been in control of her Facebook and been deleting posts as well as been unfriending people from her Facebook. However, this is all alleged, it hasn't been confirmed, but this makes people very suspicious of Larry because if this alleged thing is true, it really doesn't make sense why he would be deleting all of these things from her Facebook. And I'm really not sure at this point if it's true, but I'm sure police are looking into it. I'm not gonna go too into the theories because there's so little information released by police, so it's really hard to speculate at this point. People really fall into one of two camps, either Maya left of her own free will or that something possibly happened to her. As far as things that could have happened to her, there have been many different things speculated, but again, I'm not really going to get into it because we have so little information. It could really be anything at this point. I'm just hoping that Maya's still safe out there and that she can be brought back home to her family because she has three young kids at home who really need their mother. I'm really concerned about her kids right now and how they're coping. I can't imagine explaining to a four-year-old that their mom is missing, and so my heart really goes out to them and the family. I know that Maya's family have said that they have tried to reach out to Larry and the kids, but that they haven't gotten back to them and that Larry has only let Maya's family see the kids once since Maya disappeared. And that's just heartbreaking to me because I'm sure those kids really miss their aunts and uncles and you know grandparents and that they really wanna see them. And I really think that that would be beneficial to those kids right now. I think the more people to help them and support them, the better. And I just don't really understand why he wouldn't let the kids see them. So again, that's another reason why many people have speculated that, you know, Larry seems guilty, allegedly. 
And so, you know, that just adds to the suspicion. I know that there's going to be many searches over this coming weekend. So if you live anywhere near the Chula Vista area and you're interested, be sure to look that up. I'll definitely link it down below as well as the family's GoFundMe page because they're trying to hire a private investigator. So if you're interested in that, I will link it down below. I'm really hoping there'll be updates in this case like there were in Jason's case and I'll be able to give those to you guys soon. But as of now, this is all that I have on this case. Again, that's all I have for you today, guys. Thank you so much for watching and be sure to like and subscribe to share Maya's story. Thank you so much. Bye.